All right, waiting for it to go green. Yay! All right, welcome to Vlog Thursday, episode 116. I had to stare at that a second. Now, first thing I want to say is I have no control over the ads. I get s some of the same people every time. I don't like the ads that showed up in this. I don't know what to tell you. The ads show up because I have monetization turned on on my channel. I don't pick them. I don't choose their length. Matter of fact, it's all on auto because there is a way I can override and force it to do something more, but there's not really a way to force do something like this. Like there is some way I can go into the ad system and say, force 30 seconds ads in every video. But I think the live ones just do. Um, there's a checkbox to turn it on or off, but I don't have much control over it because I've had people even message me about the ads that come up or whatever. I don't know. It's not, as a YouTube creator, uh, the platform I get to use for free. Um, and it's in turn for ads that come in there. That is the agreement with YouTube. So that's all I'm going to say about it. I, I don't understand all the comments about complaining about the ads. I don't think YouTube reads them at all. Um, I read all my comments. I try to reply to all the comments, but I have... I only reply to, I have no control over the fact that there's an ad in here. I personally have bought YouTube Red, the, well, whatever they're calling it now, Google Play Music, blah, blah, blah thing. Um, but my whole purchase and everything for it has to do with the fact that I don't want to watch ads. So I pay my couple dollars a month to YouTube and I don't have to deal with any ads. So uh, as I watch a lot of YouTube and I don't see any ads. So that's, that's as far as that goes. Um, Oddly, it says there's nobody here and there's nobody messaging. So I'll actually say hi, make sure it's working. So it should be. All right. Oh, one watching. Okay. Bumped up to one. Weird. Usually there's a bunch of people that notify. So we'll see how that goes. It's also odd. The stream health is uh, really low right now. Anyways, back over to a couple of things I want to talk about. One of them was uh, I'll, a comment on the sunburn. Uh, if you wonder if my face is pink, uh, that's not a lighting problem. I am pink. <laughs> uh, I went out for a long bike ride uh, to avoid burnout. I'm actually, I went out for about 50 something miles on my bike roughly. And uh, I like to pedal places, not motorcycle. I had motorcycle too. Uh, but that's one of those things I think people don't stop and take enough time to do is you get really burned out working in this industry. You can, it's a lot. Uh, I was over in, I spend a lot of time reading on Reddit more than posting, but I was on Reddit and people were talking about getting burned out working for these MSPs and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, it's like important that you take a little time, a little self-care and go, hey, I'm just going to do nothing. I don't even listen to podcasts when I go out. I just like, I have my phone on me in case of emergency. It's in my backpack and my, well, my bags and my bike. And I go riding. I went, I disappeared for eight hours. I went over to the, you know, I live in the Great Lakes area. So I went over to the Great Lakes, chilled out, got a sunburn. So my head's pink, um, which isn't really why I haven't done videos. I've just been busy, but it's, it's definitely like my face was peeling the last couple of days because I got really, really sunburned. We finally had sun here in Michigan. But uh, that I won't dwell on that too much other than it, it's a reminder. It's um, a discussion I just had on Reddit with people of, yeah, hey, I, I, one of the reasons I run a company is so I have a company that doesn't suck, uh, that doesn't suck to work at, where people aren't going, oh, my God, I hate coming to work. I hate coming to my job uh, because, you know, I work for a company that doesn't give me enough resources, doesn't get anything done, um, is maximizing profits at the expense of everyone's sanity. I just... Yeah, I don't like companies like that. I've worked for uh, companies like that, kind of, sort of. Um, and I have friends that definitely have bounced jobs quite a few times in the tech industry because they've worked for these companies that just they just beat them up. They won't give them what they need because that would cost money and their bottom line is on the line. So maybe some of you work for IT companies like that or have uh, dealt with some of them. They can be kind of a pain in the butt. But, hey, that happens. Uh, that's why I do the things the way I do to try to keep it um, a lot better. We're going to get to what, what's behind the screen here in a second. The next thing to talk about is, uh, well, I guess that is the next thing, the dragon blood. So, actually, I spelled burnout wrong. So, let me fix the title. All right, there we go. If I don't fix it now, it'll be broken forever. Um, so if you remember back in the days of WPA2, okay, so that's still current because WPA2 has been around a long time uh, and it will be for, around for a long time because not everything supports uh, WPA3. But back in 2018 in October, we had the crack attack. 
and it was the key reinstallation attacks. And this was a way that uh, certain devices could be, so to speak, forced to give up some of their WPA2 information so you could hijack some of the session information within the Wi-Fi. Well, this session uh, hijacking and everything, you know, caused, caused for great concern what happened and everything else. Well, WPA3 was supposed to address things like that. But the similarities in the website, because we have the same security researchers, and they analyzed WP3's Dragonfly Handshake. And the Dragonfly Handshake is, is part of the internal protocol about how the handshake itself works. So it, they have all the details. Maybe I'll dive deeper into this after I read through it in, in more detail. But it's actually pretty impressive. Um, they found some weaknesses in the way this was implemented. Uh, I think they have, it, they have the paper. <laughs> there we go. But they actually will, let me move my head out of the way here. They can walk you through how they do it, and it's impressive. They walk through each part of the handshake and walk you through how they attack it. Now, the part that's really impressive here <coughs> is um, the when they go into the details of how this worked, they were able to do a couple things with this attack. One, they were able to uh, compromise and gather information to get a hashed key for later reverse engineering. The second part is with a Raspberry Pi, just the Raspberry Pi, they were able to take down an AP. So with very little compute power, something as small as a Raspberry Pi, some of the B plus, I know they're fairly powerful, they're nice little machines, but that was enough compute power to take down WPA3. And that is just, yeah, that is just crazy that this exists because they spent a lot of time in secret <laughs> building WPA3. I say in secret because that's part of the problem with the Wi-Fi Alliance. The Wi-Fi Alliance is a pay-to-play game. So let's talk about the Wi-Fi Alliance real quick. Wi-Fi Alliance. So the Wi-Fi Alliance that give us this fancy logo licenses and pay to play, they don't develop their uh, protocol in an open forum like many other security protocols are developed. So you end up with a protocol based on what a few smart people in a room um, came up with. And that may not always be the best way to do it because if this protocol would have been publicly discussed before it was ratified as a standard, these guys would have had their input beforehand, as opposed to after it was ratified as a standard, after it was pushed out to vendors, after ev everything else, and it came out like, hey, we've done da 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 Oh, by the way, after we got to look at it, now that it's out, um, it apparently has some flaws in it. And this is that security through obscurity. Like, one, the standard was going to come out because eventually, even though you have to buy it, you can't just get it. You got to buy a copy of it. Apparently, it's not just downloadable and then you get a license or get certified for the standard um, and everything else because it's an alliance. This is not how the IEEE works, but it's how the Wi-Fi alliance works. You want all these protocols done in the public view. That is the best way to do it because having a secret of how the protocol was put together doesn't add anything to security. Matter of fact, you have now reduced the opportunity for security researchers who are willing to do deep dives and poke at it with a Raspberry Pi and a simple Python script and figure out if they did it. And matter of fact, they have in this write-up I did read, um, they have a couple of mitigations. They said if it would have been implemented a slightly different way, there would have been a way to avoid this at the very beginning, but they fundamentally designed it wrong. So now they have to do a different type of patch to stop this attack from happening. So it's just, yeah. Uh, and I believe this uh, attack affects WPA Enterprise as well with WPA3. They got everything covered in detail. It certainly affects the consumer one more because um, there's another step you have to do if you have an extra key associated with it. So uh, it's, Ah, it's kind of a mess. Now, one of the good things is WPA3 even does support um, encrypted channels, even if you're not using a password on it. That was one of the features they added. So it's all part of the encrypted handshake, and this got taken apart and taken down, essentially. So it's all kind of a downgrade attack. There's a lot of... This is one of the downsides of Wi-Fi. Granted, Wi-Fi is a proximity attack, but it is a scary part to have that on your network because, well, 
you need really long passwords. You need really good entropy to make it hard to reverse engineer the passwords. And that's just a risk of Wi-Fi. And it's kind of scary because everything's going Wi-Fi. But then again, um, some companies and security people are very mindful of not having everything over Wi-Fi and keeping everything like very um, tight, as in they keep it inside the uh, wires all the time, you know, not Wi-Fi. The other, what mitigates a little bit of the risk of Wi-Fi to an extent is the fact that it's uh, proximity-based. You have to be within X range of my building to attack my Wi-Fi. Uh, you could probably get an extended antenna to an ex and be a little bit further away. Maybe I wouldn't notice you, but um, we have a building that's in a strip mall. Um, so you'd have to be in one of the adjacent strip malls. You'd have to be uh, in the parking lot. Once you're into the next parking lot, our Wi-Fi doesn't reach. So it's one of the things you kind of notice when people are doing it, but still it's, it's still an attack scenario that you have. And of, of course, one of the other things that has been done is when you have someone dropping off a Raspberry Pi somewhere within range, physical range of the network, well, they can keep attacking your network and it's really hard to locate where that Raspberry Pi is because they plugged it in at the neighbors next door. So unless you search your neighbors for it, you know, they can keep attacking your network and brute forcing it. But I found it was really interesting read. It's very detailed. Uh, for those of you that want it, I'll throw it, you know, I'll just throw the uh, link into the description of the video here. Go, drop it over here. There we go. Do, 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 do. Scroll down. There we go. Dragon blood. Yeah, I mean, what WP Enterprise is a little bit more secure, um, but it's still Wi-Fi, so there's still potential attacks on it. As a matter of fact, um, the also used an EAP, yes, the EAP version, that's the Enterprise uh, access. So yes, it's in both. This flaw was found in both versions, uh, Enterprise and the uh, home user, essentially, like the non-Enterprise one. So... It's the flaws in both, and I believe that even with the crack attack, the flaw was in both. Let me look for EAP in this. It's been a while since I looked at this one. Yep. EAP replay. So I think it's in, I think it was in here too. It's been a while since I read through this one. I'm not going to take the time to read it all now and find it, but I'll leave links in here. This is the crack attack. Same security researchers. They did a great job. Hand, hands off to these guys to uh, uh, putting this together. So definitely thing there. Now, let's talk about one of the next things, the not so hostile MSP takeovers. We've actually, over the last couple of weeks, we took over a couple of companies and one of them was a medical office and another MSP, which I got a great thank you letter yesterday that made me happy from uh, the management team at the company we took over, the, the, the medical company that we took over of, thank you for being very responsive. You made this very pain-free um, and, we, the good news is the other MSP didn't appear to have anything nefarious that they missed, but the usual problem we run into, um, they didn't have updates loaded. They didn't have software updates on lots of things. So we just had to do some of the updates. So they were charging them MSP in the typical we see. They were slow to respond, slow, always wanted to tell their clients, oh, issue a ticket, issue a ticket, we'll get to you, issue a ticket. And of course they issue tickets and they wouldn't get to them. And that's a, that's a sign. And this is what I'm talking about at the very beginning about this burnout MSP problem. That's a big sign that these companies probably are not dedicating enough resources to handle the clients. And from a business standpoint, the reason or not is people going, well, I would make less money if I got to hire another tech for eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year. I make eighty, ninety thousand dollars a year less if these guys can just do it, and I don't have to hire another tech. Yay! Um, and that's that mentality these people get caught up in because it, it's employees are the most expensive thing in an MSP. Um, that's why I did that video about solar winds increase their price by a couple percent. I'm like, whoopee. Um, it, it doesn't even affect what one week of payroll is. It's so minuscule to where you're spending the money. Um, so these companies, you know, they want to do everything on the cheap. And I think that's what this company, and they lost a client over it. That's a great recurring revenue client. 
because they couldn't keep up with it and they weren't keeping up with the updates. And like I said, if they can't even answer the phone to answer basic trouble tickets and basic problems that are being had that were stopping the client from working, they certainly aren't taking the time out of their day to make sure the firmware was up to date on things. So lots of firmware updates and stuff like that. Just going through an audit, it's not even that hard to do. Um, and I try to keep my workload on my staff you know, unstressed clients, super happy because I'd rather have a company like that than a company that is a bunch of stressed people that just drag into work each day going, God, I don't know, and answer these uh, problems. I also, and everyone asks me about my ticketing methods. I'm using email. We use Google Groups. We follow up with all the clients. I never find it that hard. I haven't found the need to create a ticket for every single thing that comes in because we're not letting everything stack up and try to organize it. I keep enough staff to do it. I, I just know a lot of people don't, um, but that's, it depends on how you want to run your business. Um, there's, there's someone in my forums had asked that question before. Let me see if I can find that. Cause that was a discussion that got broke down. Okay. Only now I'm getting time. I see there's some new, more forum stuff I got to get to. Um, but it was about staffing and, you know, people always look for that ratio for doing it. I'm like, no, there's not a ratio for staffing. You staff to make sure you have enough staff to handle your workload. There's not like a, there's not a ratio. So the, you know, this person's like, oh, how do I, uh, curious what, how you got, how many texts do you have to support your clients? Well, I look at it as I need to hire more techs when I'm not servicing clients in a reasonable time. Not, some companies are very needy, some companies are very uh, relaxed. We've picked up another architectural firm. They're great. They are super sex savvy. So we come in and uh, like these guys have made it so easy for us to be their IT company because they just, they had all the passwords organized. They didn't have an IT company. This wasn't a takeover one. Um, this was just, they needed an IT company. They grew and they were trying to find some solutions. We threw in a Synology, threw in a few things to organize her life better. But boy, they've had every password, every login, everything for us all organized. So setting them up on the MSP, setting up the managed program, upgrading their computers, uh, everything has just been super easy. So it's, that kind of stuff is great. Like these are, yeah, that's just, you know, that client does not need a full-time tech dedicated to them. They actually have not hardly generated any tickets since we took them over. Um, everything's just been project-based and we organize it. And they've been fine with, hey, we'll get it done in the next couple of days. Oh, great. Whenever you get it done, just let us know. Like they're not pressuring us and nothing's been an emergency because they have really nice equipment and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm reading an email that came up because I actually, I want to address, I'm going to address this email. Maybe this person's watching. Probably they're not. People who don't follow processes, <laughs> they, they may not get replies from me. I reply to a lot of emails and I, I got someone to email me. Hey, Tom, what do you think of PF sets? I, I don't even know if that's worth a reply. Um, what do I think of it? I have a bunch of videos on it. Like, are you getting at a question? I have a form. Uh, I have, well, you go to our website, there's a contact form. It says, if you want to pay me, you can contact me via email because you want to hire us for services. You can for free. And I answer everyone's questions in here, uh, about PF sense and things like that. People who just email me out of the blue, Hey, I want to do a thing. I usually just email a price with no other context to it. And then you get mad. And I'm like, I don't know how you're mad. You, you just said, what do you think of PF sense? I think I consult at this rate. <laughs> what do you want? What more did you want to know? And the person's like, well, I wanted this, this, this. I'm like, well, do you want to pay me? Well, no, I just want to know what you think of it. Then no, I'm, I, hate, I hate to sound like that, but at some point I get so many emails a day. I have to be focused on the ones that keep the bills going. I post for free and help everyone out for free in forums. Um, and I post a lot in here and I reply a lot in here. Well, as long as it's something I know about, I'll admit if you notice, or if you're one of the people that maybe uh, you see no reply, someone had an obscure network switch. I don't know. I've never used it before. I have no idea. You bought an obscure network switch. You asked a question. I can't answer that because I'd never used it before, but all the PF sense stuff and everything else is, you know, I answer all the questions I can or any questions about videos I've made um, and things like that. I've had plenty of talks about. Uh, can you move to Michigan and have me as a mentor? <laughs> I do charge for mentoring. 
uh, Jason, I only keep tickets for stuff in my shop, but if you email me or call me, I'll remote in if I'm busy. Um, appointment, schedule appointment in Google Calendar. Yeah, we do that too. We just throw it on there. Hey, thank you, Bill Green, for throwing a dollar at me. Awesome. Um, but yeah, they, I, we, this is an example of what happened today. Um, and we're, we're swamped today because we're short staffed. So today was just, <laughs> um, but it was like this, you know, we came in customer emailed us right away. Hey, we have a problem. And, uh, they couldn't figure out because they have restrictions on, they use tablets in the field and they couldn't figure out how to get around the restrictions to get them updated. So they need someone to come out and show them how to get around restrictions. We looked at the calendar. They are like about 10 minutes drive from our office. I said, I can have someone out there an hour. We go out there, we fix it. We're only there for, you know, 30, 40 minutes. Uh, uh, tech gets back. He sends them an invoice. Matter of fact, they already paid the invoice. Like that's our whole process. I didn't have to create a ticket. There's not a bunch of things. The invoice is what we did. Came out there, fixed uh, elevated permissions on Apple iPad uh, to allow customers app to update done. That's it. That's just... That's as simple as that. You're done. So I, keeping it simple, keeping it so you service the staff, that's just the easier way to do it. Any plans to look at a way to port zero tier to PF Sense? Not really. I don't know that zero tier makes a lot of sense on PF Sense. Uh, I don't, I'm not a coder. So I've had a few people comment on that and I'm like, cool, get coding. Can you do it on PF Sense? Yeah, if you write the code, you could do it. Um, I'm not a coder. That's, I'm not a programmer. I'm not a developer. Uh, I, it's not my mainstay. It's not what I do for a living. So great. If you want to integrate it, awesome. I don't, it seems like it's a product that was more designed. You probably could do it. It does have a BSD package for zero tier, but it seems more like something you would want to run on each individual computer because that's kind of the point of zero tier. So you want it to run on each individual computer so that computer has access to the resource that you've attached that to. Um, the zero tier edge is kind of cool. Uh, it's a box that will do things and you could just do this on a Linux box and bridge it. If you want to, for example, have a printer attached to a zero tier network, it's, it's cool. Maybe you want a printer attached to it, but maybe the other way to do it is keep the printer on the local network because you end up with two network adapters when you set up zero tier. So one network adapter is of the local network where printers and things would live. And the other one would be the to attached to the device you want to attach to. And that's the kind of the concept in zero tier is you set up a zero tier for each and every computer. So you control access through the zero tier control panel. So they're all connected to the resource on the other side of the network. And no matter where those computers move, they're not tied to the, a particular VPN or even have a VPN on their computer. They move, but the IP address of that resource that zero tier connects them to keeps static so they can move to around anywhere they want. So it's, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Uh, I don't have a use case. I, I, I'll throw that word out there for on, on zero tier on PSS. It's kind of cool. It'd be neat if they did because um, maybe there is a time you have some devices you want to create on there, but there's a lot of little bridging things you'd have to do to make sure it works right. So it could be tricky. Um, do you have a default PF Sense config or you create one for every customer? I create them for every customer. Um, there is no default because the out of the box PF Sense is fine. Uh, we add a couple plugins. So I thought about doing a video on what plugins we add, but the out of the box configuration of PF Sense is locked down. It is tight. There is not ports open. It, it defaults to everything closed. So the default out of the box for a small business that has no port forwards or anything is actually pretty good. Um, maybe you want to do things like DNS sec if they need it, if the PF Sense is handling the DNS. If they have a Active Directory system, PF Sense isn't handling the DNS uh, directly. So you may or may not do that. We like to add PF Blocker. Uh, we like to add, um, I don't always add Sericata on there. Kind of depends on whether or not they want to pay for the setup and tuning and dealing with it because Sericata is not a set it and forget it type of thing. Um, so it's one of those, eh, there's kind of a default setup of it. So I, maybe I'll do a video on some of the out of the box things we do, but you know, we, I don't have a ton of them on there. So it's this, uh, Oh, this is good. This is Tom talking himself out of the sale. 
<laughs> so um, a customer had originally wanted, and this, so zero tier, I had a few people that this possibly solved a problem for. One of them though, before I found out about zero tier, it asked me and I gave him a price on, um, they had a handful of things they needed connected. They needed a VPN with I think six sites or seven sites. And they needed the VPNs to have routes back to all of them. Well, the problem is if you do that, you have to have a lot of rules back and forth. So um, when you have all those rules going back and forth, it gets a little bit more complicated. And all they really wanted to do was be able to access all these um, data, some sales data that was being generated at each location. So uh, zero, they, I suggested zero tier for them and the person was able to set up themselves. So I guess I talk, um, I talked myself out of a sale because zero tier literally solved it for less than I would have got paid to do that. But that's me being the geek more so than the sales guy. And this is actually the challenge some open source problems have is it's hard to make a lot of money on this compared to I could have sold them a real expensive VPN solution, a bunch of hardware set up and transitioned all their stuff and um, spend lots of billable hours configuring it. So... That's kind of the back and forth. Uh, I have another sale very similar uh, like that where we could have sold them Wi-Fi, but it wouldn't have solved their problem. Uh, so I didn't because they had a problem with 802.11r. 802.11r. So that's the roaming standard for uh, the base station transition. Turns out that they have devices that are having roaming problems based on this. So their devices aren't transitioning properly and not handing off. So they wanted a new Wi-Fi proposal. We're looking at a different way. Uh, it's better for them to spend money on the endpoints, uh, the devices that are having the problem because they're old. And that's where the problem lies. So selling a more Wi-Fi wouldn't have solved their problem. But the salesperson, you know, oh, yeah, you know, we just need to do this. And that's what everyone else's proposal was. Uh, do I have any experience or thoughts on Datto? Never use the Datto. Um, Datto's a neat product. Never used it though. Uh, I've heard good things about them. No, that's it. The world leading provider of MSP delivered IT solutions. Datto's kind of interesting because they started out as like this backup company and they went and acquired a bunch of other stuff. Uh, so cool. They seem to have a neat program. Their, their Datto backup solution uh, was supposed to be really good. It seems to be not... It, uh, it's not cheap. I know that. Um, I've known a few people that they looked at how the Datto system works, like when you get with the Datto NAS or the uh, Datto Auto. I mean, it does seem a pretty solid system, but it's pricey. Low cost of entry, that's subjective. <laughs> and if you're not familiar with how Datto works, it basically will mirror, not this one, um, the higher end ones. It basically will mirror a, I don't know which models are which. It can mirror a server for like failover. So if your server fails over with a data box, it like has an image of the server so you can uh, quickly spin your server back up virtually because it's being back up to data all the time. So you eliminate some of the downtime. That's kind of how the data backups works. I think it's kind of cool. I, I think it's a neat idea. Uh, I prefer to do it with a series of virtualization systems. And I talked about this before. And one of the reasons I like the Zen Orchestra combined with Zen Server is if you go over here, actually, let me do it on the other one. Should I be this one? Uh, if you go here to the backup, continuous replication is uh, one of the things you can do. What do I think about the DS1019 plus? I don't know what that is. Oh, distation. I like the Synologies. I got to finish some more reviews on Synology. We have one. Uh, where is it at? We have a Synology right here. I like them. I've got more reviews going on there. So yeah. 
Um, I know nothing about the Datto RMM PSA. I only know Solar Winds. Uh, I don't know anything about Dattos. I've heard about ConnectWise's, but don't know a lot about it. Like practical use, I don't know a lot about it. I'm just aware of it. Uh, don't don't have a lot of answers. I don't have time to test all the PSAs. Um, they're a pain to switch back and forth to. I don't have time to like to just move all my clients over. But one of the other ways you can do is, uh, and this is a video I didn't finish making. Um, wow, that's from January. Uh, but continuous replication allows you to take and continuously on a, um, take a VM, live running VM, and set up a continuous replication based on a schedule like every 15 minutes and have an entire backup of that particular virtual machine always going. And it only takes, and this is actually what's interesting, and you can see here, um, started at 1048, ended at 1049, one minute duration, and it only takes one minute to replicate an entire virtual machine because it only needs the delta difference between them. And this is one of my arguments about, like, this is a enterprise little feature that I I don't understand people in, because I know a Proxbox guy and he says it doesn't work this way. People are like, well, you could do snapshots and migrations. I said, yeah, but it's not the same. So... Uh, snapshot migration is not the same as the way continuous replication works in uh, in here to be able to do it. But that kind of gives you that, you know, solid that you're looking for um, solid backups and you're doing it on all standardized hardware. So, yeah. Uh, am I a Taco Tuesday? Sure, we love Taco Tuesday. We like tacos here. We eat a lot of, we eat a decent amount of tacos. There's a uh, place down the street that's got this carne asada steak fries. They're insanely good. We get that and some tacos and uh, it's killer. It's definitely pretty awesome. But yeah, I don't have any opinion on Datto RMM. Some people seem to use it. Some people seem to be happy with it. I, yeah, I don't know. It, it would take a lot of time. Like someone would really have to pay me to sit down and evaluate RMM tools head to head. It's just one of those you know, uh, really hard things to do and stuff like that. But this is still cool. The zero tier, I'm going to do a few more. I want to do a Synology video with zero tier and put together a couple things on it. Um, I also want to do a, uh, the phone system with zero tier. I want to see how it works with free PBX. That's going to be kind of cool because I want to see how, I don't know if the latency is enough to do phone calls over it. Never tried. So that's uh, never you know, haven't really had any time to test that, but free PBX, I could probably add zero tier to it because it's a Linux distro, get it configured and then tie my phone to it and see how good of a solution it is. I'm kind of curious, but it all comes down to latency, but because it's using UDP protocol, it should be fairly low latency to work. So it would be pretty cool. Uh... Yeah, funny thing I've noticed is most small NAS boxes, small 2U storage servers from Synology, uh, Celeron processors or Pentium dual core processors, non-ECC. Yeah, that is correct. Most of them do not. Until you get into the enterprise stuff, um, you don't really end up with a lot of ECC. I think they have, when you look at their larger one, what is it? What's their big ones called? Uh, there we go. Once you get into something like this, then you're back into ECC. And that's with any company that's building these. When you get the free NAS boxes, you don't get, if you, well, true NAS. Uh, we'll go over here. Till you get into the higher end, true NAS boxes, the same thing. Their basic stuff's not going to be all, you know, ECC. But when you get into these higher end ones, it's nothing but. So these are all much higher end, much larger, uh, you know, max capacity, 504 terabytes, one petabyte, two, 10 petabyte for this one here, the M50 series. Um, these are going to have ECC memory in them. They're going to have the much faster processors in them. Does it say the processor specs? But they're all SAS drives in here, except for these. These are the MV DIMMs when you get in here, which is awesome with uh, SAS SSDs. So, yeah, that's... That's how it works. And uh, same thing with uh, 45 Drives. They make some really cool products. Because they're kind of a roll your own. 
So if you look at their products, the Stornator or the Stornado, that's the SSD one here, which is kind of cool. Then we have the Stornator. Xeon, 8 gig DDR4, 16 gig DDR4. I'm willing to bet because these are Xeons that they're probably um, ECC, but what's like when we get to the big ones, like the XL60. Nope, not until you get the XL60, it's marked as ECC. So the basic ones don't. So you get to the big ones, now you're back into the ECC. ECC is just an extra level redundancy, but I don't, uh, that argument has come up. I've made videos on this, so I'm not going to go into rant on it. So. Yeah, Linus uh, Tech Tips uses Storinator, Storinators. They're great systems. They're really uh, popular for high-end storage. And because you can use them with whatever storage solution you want, so you don't have to run these with FreeNAS, you can run these with Unraid. I think that's what Linus runs is Unraid. He doesn't run FreeNAS. So definitely uh, something you can do with them if you, you know, however you wanted to use them. They're, they're flexible. That's why they're so popular. And I like that they have their prices on there. So you can get how many hard drives in here? Uh, build it. Let's just build a big one here. You can price it all out right here, though. You just kind of go, what do I want on it? Server software, we're going to go free NAS. Still ship it to you with the free NAS on there. Dual processor. 64 gigs of RAM. <laughs> How many hard drives do you want? Does it have it on here? Uh, did I miss it at the beginning? Where's the processors on? You can choose all this. Boot drive is a single. Well, you may as well have it. Yeah, single SSD, uh, redundant boot. Yeah, configured shipping warranty. There we go. 14, 14, 12. Oh. Yeah, we'll go with these. Exos 14 terabyte. So how many will go in here? So the, will it hold 60 hard? Yeah, I think the 60 holds 60 hard drives. So what if we needed 60 hard drives in here? There we go. $44,000 server. There we go. <laughs> uh, yeah, some companies go, no, we don't tell you the price. Con yeah, he contacted rep. That's... Just tell people the price. It's stupid. Uh, what is my favorite OS, Linux? Well, what do you think? Do I like Linux? Let's say I have an entire channel about open source. I run Linux on all my computers. I probably like Linux. Sorry, I'm feeling smart ass today, but yes. <laughs> the um, uh, Definitely, I've been running Linux for... I, I'm trying to find the date, and I can't exactly, but I'm working on it. I'm, gonna, I'm trying to find like where I posted something in a forum... Um, the, I think I, 2011 or 10 is when I went full-time with Linux, but it may have been before then. Uh, it may have been in 2009. So I'm trying to find some documents, uh, when I made some notes of when I switched everything over, but I've been running it for at least eight years, maybe 10. So between eight and 10 years, full-time desktop, but I've been a Linux admin since 1998. Eight is when I first got into having some admin stuff that I did. And by 99, I had a job doing it. So I've been running Linux for 20 years as a server OS. Um, and then less, at least 10 years as a desktop OS. Uh, AMD Epics, yes, those are really cool. So if you haven't seen them, uh, AMD Epic. They even have an Epic Mini ITX that's really cool by Supermicro. So, yes, they are definitely cool. Um, the Epic processors are epic. <laughs> yeah, that's cheesy, I know. But, uh, yeah, I we've been talking and tossing this around of building a couple small servers with them. It, they're pricey. Uh, what does this board go for? This uh, Supermicro. Come on. Come on, stupid. There we go. They have a buy it now somewhere. They have a pricing somewhere. Can we find a price for that on Amazon? Nope.
Uh, AMD. Well, there's not as bad as I thought. 2,000, 1,000. Here's a super micro board without the chip. So, yeah, the Gigabyte one here is about uh, 521. Get an Epic chip on there, depending on which 1,000. So, $1,500. Not horrible. So, you can, you can build these for a pretty reasonable price. Not bad. They've been impressive and everything else. I've been looking at building a new machine, so uh, for myself, I haven't decided exactly what I'm going to do. Um, we, you know, the Ryzen threes are coming out, so that'll probably be my next system. This is an old i seven system. It works great. It just doesn't render video as fast as I want. Uh, what's my interview process like? Um, I'm assuming you mean for hiring new techs, and most of the time, it's just. Sitting down, talking to them, uh, figuring out where their passion is, uh, just finding, you know, are they into the tech side? Are they into the uh, hacking? Are they into that? that? There's little things that it's hard to describe, um, but it's some of the things I go through with interviewing the techs and figuring out what they've accomplished, what they can do, and figuring out that. And then I usually throw them to the wolves uh, back there. I, they have to hang out with the current tech team and uh, see if they can do stuff. So, you know, there's a lot of slow onboarding even after we do that because they may not last after I hire them. So there's always like a trial period of coming in and figuring out whether or not they can do the things they said they can do because that's what it really comes down to. There's a lot of scenarios I'm going to ask them about to see if they're, they lied on a resume. Like I'll ask a question about do you know how to do this thing that you have here? What Explain it. And I, being technical means I can interview them at a technical level. So... Oh, uh, yeah, the hot sauce component. Definitely something we've thought about. <laughs> uh, do a video on rack mount UPSs? Um, maybe. I don't know. They're UPSs. I don't, I'm don't. i not sure what's exciting about them. Like, how to buy one? I don't. I guess I don't understand. Like, we don't spend a lot of thought on those. We put them in because they're necessary, but they're not something I spend uh, a ton of time researching. Uh, the APC ones are nice. The camera, we've uh, eaten eaten ups we've like we bought a few of those because they also do line conditioning so but i've never i don't know i never re, i don't think i've ever reviewed them um we put some of these in for clients because they offer line conditioning they're really a solid product i don't remember if i ever reviewed one or not Let's find out. Did Tom review one of these? Nope. I talked about it. I had a few of them and I was going to and never got around to it because we've put a few of these in for clients because they offer line conditioning and are expandable. Uh, when you buy an Eaton one, you can daisy chain more of them to it to get like more batteries on them. They, they, they are, any one we've put in have been really, really solid. Yeah, so look at these Eaton ones. Those are ones I know we've bought a handful of that we've never had a problem with. Uh, and they've just done a great job because they offer line conditioning as well. I don't, remember, I don't know. That, I don't think that we bought them off Amazon, though. I don't remember where we got them from. I didn't buy them. One of my staff did. But see, there's a difference between, and I think Eaton has an explainer. I guess Maybe this is a good video. Uh, Eaton line conditioning PS. So there's a big difference in design, whether you get a line conditioner or you get a UPS. They are not the same thing. You can have a line conditioning UPS as well. So uh, you have to understand the difference between them. So the way a line conditioner works is the power comes in, converts, goes to the battery then the battery converts back. There's a separation. So any variation coming in on power doesn't matter because it's constantly and always converting. So yeah, that's that's a, a big difference. Oh, actually, um, and someone pointed out something. I just got a private message. Um, there is, if you're running a UPS, and I, we've used this, there's a tools inside of PFSense that do allow for 
uh, UPS to tell the PF sense to shut down. So you can send a shutdown signal through that as well. So you can shut it down gracefully. Um, that's an important part with the UPS is being, and a lot of them have this, but there's a lot of tools so the, the UPS can communicate and do graceful shutdowns of all the things. Uh, let's see. Have you put zero tier on Synology yet? Nope, have not done that yet. That's on my to-do list. Uh... I changed the ID, thus the IP is Synology units on ZT. Cool. Auburn Hills, awesome. Just down the road from us, that is correct. Which open source project have I commuted? Um, I've put a lot of time into a lot of them. I don't know. I mean, I've done all these tutorial videos. I am the most popular, to my knowledge, tutorial videos on, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, Zen Orchestra. I've done a lot of time into that. I've done a few on Caden Live, and I've donated monetarily to a handful of them too, including Caden Live. Um, I don't know. I never really broke it down or measured it. So, and, and here's like the zero tier thing. It's an open source project. I I don't even know anybody at there. Um, I just did a video on it, and it's become very popular. I think it has about ten thousand views already. So that's kind of a, I guess that's con I guess it def define contributing and things like that. So. <laughs> Uh, are certs important to you when it comes to hiring? Not really. I don't look for certs. I don't have any. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pop this out so you guys can see it. Pop out chat. Hey, yay. Okay. Put this over here. Uh, any certs important? Nope. Which works? Uh, what's the coolest thing you missed? I have no idea. I don't know what's cool anymore. I'm old. I, I'm a, I don't always know what's cool. So, um... All right, cool. I can carry on. It's just easier if this is popped out so I can read this better. Matter of fact, I'm going to move things around here. Slide this over. Let's make my screen look more normal. Put this over here so I can read it without staring staring into the abyss. And then I'll put my head... Actually, I'll put my head at the top or at the bottom. There we go. Cool. Someone asked me to do this. I always forget, like, put the chat on the screen. So it, you can watch it in a video later. That's, I forget to do that. Maybe there's a better way to do it. If someone knows a better way, let me know. If not, this is the way it's being done. <laughs> what else do you want to know? What is the other thing I was going to talk about? Is there anything else? I don't know that there was because um, I have a funeral to go to shortly. Uh, which I'm curious. I got to sign in. The uh, funeral is because Corey, who I mentioned, his dad had passed. Uh, all right, cool. Um, Corey's dad had passed, and so I do have to go to that funeral today. So I have to leave here in about 15 or 20 minutes. Um, you know, it's unfortunate, uh, but that's one thing about a small business that not every, and I talked to them about this, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I said the personal side of business, when you run a small business, you are kind of just a family of people. We all know each other really well. Um, and having, you know, even the contractors, they come and hang out with us and things like that. So like someone says, so how many employees do we have now direct staff? There is eight, nine of us is direct staff. Um, Outside of that is contractors. The eight of us are direct staff. I, I don't know. I think about that. I think about payroll on Friday. Um, and the contractors are just as much a part because we, they do a lot of work with us. I, I, today, right now, and that's why I look over my phone to make sure it ain't ringing. Um, I have a couple contractors on site finishing a job right now. And that's, you know, we, we keep really good relationships with lots of different contractors, even though if they do work for other companies and things like that. And it's usually for handling some of the physical layer stuff. Um, the techs internally handle anything that is more sensitive nature, cybersecurity, where they have access to passwords. No contractors have any access because they don't need it uh, to passwords. The contractors do have access to uh, be able to do some of the billing and things like that. So they have access to some systems, but not all systems. Um, but, you know, we're all friendly. We're all, like, going and hanging out uh, and 
doing stuff. They've come over my house. They know where I live. You know, we, some of us even ride motorcycles together, or do stuff uh, after work. So they all know me and I keep those open relationships. And this goes even to expand outside of the Detroit area. I have a few other people I contract that are out that are same thing. I need to get something done or some special project. I reach out to them. So it's, um, it's, one of those things of keeping it all friendly, keeping it all uh, like that. It, it's, it's the nature of the business. It's also important. Like I, even when a new IT company opens up, one of them opened up down the street and I sent the guy a message and I stopped by and said, hi, they're very standoffish and don't know why some other IT person would want to talk to them. I'm like, look, uh, I don't look at competitors as the enemy or anything like that. Matter of fact, a lot of times we find gaps that they do or we do that we can help each other and work together. I don't go around stealing clients. I'm not trying to take something directly from them. Um, and frequently, that's why we don't know each other because they service their clients well. So I become friendly with them and we trade business back and forth. There's plenty of business to go around and there's a ton of specialties and a lot of different things on there. So yeah, they may be good at trenching for some of those cable runs and stuff like that. Uh, you besides just how many, just how behind the funeral industry is when it comes to tech and IT. No, we aren't. We have funeral companies as clients. We have a few of them. Yeah, uh, they're like dead last in tech. <laughs> okay, that's bad. <laughs> but <laughs> no, the, the funeral industry, it's not exactly a high tech industry. So that's... Uh, that's definitely a thing. <laughs> All right, so this dragon's blood is going to be interesting. Uh, I'm going to get going here in a couple minutes. Any final questions for the good of the class? I'll, I see I got three new messages I have to answer in here. I'll answer those after I get back from the funeral. I will be doing a few more videos on zero tier. I want to explore it a little more. Uh, matter of fact, uh, a couple people, Xavier from the How I Got Hacked, um, he's already... Xavier is, he's someone who's awesome to know in person. Uh, he's fun and he's uh, already met and talked to some of the engineers at Zero Tier. He took a deep interest in it. So <laughs> it's kind of one of those um, uh, fun things that like we're all poking at this, looking at it from a lot of different angles because um, I have a very large customer I'm consulting with that may be deploying some of this as a solution. So it's kind of exciting. Um, I, in someone else that, like I said, I got a message literally while I'm doing this that originally wanted a VPN that said, Hey, zero tier, solve the VPN issue. Cause it does exactly what I need. I need these seven systems to communicate with each other, uh, even though they're all at different networks and it solves a lot of problem. Um, I was born in December for those asking for my birthday. Uh, if you want to know what my actual birthday is, uh, you have to dox me to find out. Good luck. <laughs> Uh, pretty much that the line between being friends with your customers and how you handle the business side of things for them, um, that can be muddy. Uh, let's see. I do have a lot of friends that also we do IT services for. I don't worry about it too much. I don't know. That's how I met some. That's how some of them started using me as a client. Uh, it if you as long as you're constantly doing a good job, you'll actually find it works really well uh, to have friends that you're doing it for. And they're also kind of cool because they'll take you aside uh, and say things to you and say like, yo, um, you guys didn't answer the phone or did something, whatever. Like they can be more personal. So I actually, I kind of value the few, and then it's just not a lot of them, um, but a handful of them that are like, I have more personal relationships that, that are also my clients. Because uh, they, they, they're willing to give me honest or critical feedback that you may not get from a customer um, that you have less of a relationship with. So eh, that's, I, it, it, you're right, it's muddy. And the same thing with, um, we don't have any clear, like I'm the boss. I always call everybody my coworkers. I never try to say I'm the boss or I own it. It's rare I do that unless someone has really wanted to push me um, and not want to do things the way I think they should be done. Ultimately, I make the final decision on that. So it's the only time I ever assert my authority uh, is when that. For the most part, I'm really laid back and I hire people who also are like-minded. So I I make people very independent. So they run their job without me. I don't, I'm not a micromanager. So there's, that's an important aspect to how I do things and who I hire. Um, because if they need to be babysat and micromanaged, I don't want them reporting to me. They have to report to someone else because I don't have time for that. I'm not that person. Uh, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's one of those 
way, methodologies by which I do this. I will do this though real quick so we can laugh real quick before I get off here. This I found on Reddit and really cracked me up and I tweeted it today. So it this is just great. This made me happy seeing this. Like, <laughs> and I don't know. It just made me laugh because they were putting a new floor and I found it on Reddit and I was like, I got to tweet this because this is so stupid. It's crack, it cracked me up. We all seen these and this, I don't know about worst server room. Definitely not a good server room though. So <laughs> that's, um, you know, it, it, I guess where, where you have a solution, you have to do a thing. They did the thing. I'm actually surprised. I, I feel as though that's a lot of stress on those trusses up there, but I don't know. It's only, it's not too much in there, but if it wasn't for these bottom pieces making me think it's a UPS, those weigh a few hundred pounds. The stuff up here is all lighter weight stuff. This stuff at the bottom is not light. So yeah, they're preparing to install a new floor according to the Reddit post, you know, but my, my Twitter was, you know, Hey, network definitely up one step closer to the cloud. <laughs> Hey, thank you, John Campbell, for sending me those Canadian dollars. Yeah, those are heaters on the wall. So floating server gets a whole, yeah. Sorry about the caps. <laughs> but yeah, not, I don't know. The thing is, this more looks like a switching rack than a whole server rack. You know what I mean? There's not a lot of servers in here. So maybe it's just like an IDF room, but it also looks like it's done real messy because look at the way the uh, punch panel is pl pulled away right here. Because there's the, there's the patch panel and it's all just kind of pulled out. I don't know, man. It's, it's kind of, yeah, I agree. It's actually a clever solution. It looks like they have a, a steel bar that they had that they did this for. So, and then, but this does look like a fiber conduit coming in. Oh, no, that's not fiber. That's, oh, well, this is uh, radio stuff. This is radio equipment. And I say that because um, that connector right there, that is a broadcast connector for an external antenna. It's a, it's a coax cable, exactly. <laughs> Canadian rubies, yes. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that reminds me of the CB connectors. I can't remember what they're called, but they're uh, he, years and years ago when I was a kid, I played with CB radios and base stations uh, and UHF radios and airport stuff. So I used to have all this toys I played with. That was my stuff. PL259. I, there we go. That sounds, I, I bet you're right because I'm not. So let's go to image search. I think that is, that is exactly it as a PL259. All right. I have not seen one of those since my days of playing with CBs. <laughs> oh, and for, uh, I, I don't know, for those of you that are not in the U.S., uh, CB, um, Citizen, Citizen Band Radios, uh, CB. But it was, these were the powers for the base stations that you would solder in. And I was always good with electronics. I used to fix uh, CBs for people and stuff like that, so... Yeah, this patch panel is, yeah, temporary solutions, once they work, become permanent ones. That's just how that works. There's also a multiple. There's a PL259 here, and there's a PL259 up here, too. So, or is, is that a continuous loop? Does it go, no, this one goes out, and then this one goes the other way. I don't know. You know, somehow... I was going to get my ham license. I have a handful of friends that have it. And, you know, there's a big crossover between Linux people and ham radio operators, but I never got into it. Um, I never finished any of it. I know they've even lowered the requirements. I, do you still have to have Morse code to do the ham ones? So I don't know if anyone knows that answer right now. Do you need, uh, do you still need Morse code? Do you still need, oops. Morse uh, code for ham license. Uh, but, oh, five words was, so it looks like the, you don't need it. So yeah, they changed it. No code now. So I remember back in my day, I'm old. So back in my day. <laughs> Neat. Yeah, ham radio is pretty cool. So they, 
like I said, there's a couple, there's actually a couple big ham radio operator groups right here in Michigan. They meet um, almost behind my office. They have their annual ham event uh, a few blocks from my office in a park. Uh, so they still meet every year. Uh, the big ham radio event I stop by. I know a, there's a bunch of Linux people I know. So I go there and meet with them and I'm always marveling at all this stuff. And I'm like, I get excited about it and I realize I'll never play with this. <laughs> it's it's cool. It's great. I think it's really neat, but I'll never actually do it. So I've never bothered getting my ham license. Uh, it's in July and it's called Field Day. Okay. The field, the field day here, and at least the local chapter of the of the local ham radio operators group of field day, happens to take place um, right by my office. So, I I see people throwing out their uh, ham radio names here. Awesome, I like it. Like I said, I have quite a few friends because uh, of the Linux world. There's always a bunch of Linux people that all use ham radio. This is a big crossover. There's a Venn diagram where they're all the same people. So. I definitely know that's a thing. <laughs> so, all right, what else do we have? Anything else for the good of the class? We've now talked about ham radios and SD-WAN all in one video. <laughs> um, me, I also, uh, Brett uh, had asked me something this morning. Uh, that I thought was inter this morning or Tuesday. I don't remember. Either way, me and him were having a conversation. I may make a video about this. Um, someone wanted to know some of the. Well, Brett wanted to know, and a few people have asked me before. But maybe I'll make a video about this. It'll be the um, video of how I got here. Uh, how did I get to where I am? And that's uh, like the story of all the businesses I had, how I opened and closed them, and I give a timeline. Because people, I'm always interested in people's history. I don't know that other people are, but maybe they are. And so maybe I'll make a video about that. I don't know. Is this something people are interested in? Is like, um, you know, the history of the different, how I started each business. Because um, I've had more than one. Uh, I've had Lawrence Technologies for 16 years, but there were sub-businesses that were like DBAs of this company. I don't know. Something I could put a video together if people are interested in the history of how I got here. Uh, Malcolm Clark wants to know my blood type. I don't know. I have no idea what my blood type is. Uh, got, I got, if, you, if you know, you actually know something I don't. <laughs> So let me know, as always, uh, continue the conversation in the forums. Feel free to suggest videos there. I uh, read all the comments. That's where I post a lot of the things. Uh, and, yeah, uh, on Fridays, it's 90%, 97% proof. Oh, yeah. My grandfather's answer, his blood type was, uh, what do you see, 2% whiskey and 98% baked beans. That was always his answer, so... <laughs> He always had a simple answer like that. Anyways, um, I'm out. Have fun. I'm going to stop broadcasting. Uh, like I said, jump on forums.lawrencesystems.com to – have I been to a LAN party? I have held LAN parties, so yes. Matter of fact, I, I will uh, – we'll, we'll pull Tom's old LAN party picture. We'll pull that before I go. It's in here somewhere. I have – See if I can find it. When was my LAN party? Was it 2000? Last one I did. So many years ago. Feels like it might have been 2002. 2000 something. Holy crap. I found my one of my old servers that ran... Uh, Oh, here we go. Uh, nope, I don't have pictures of the land party. I was wrong. But I do have pictures of this. So this is um, this is from April of 2002, 17 years ago. And yes, you know, this is proof. Uh, I don't know if it's really proof. I could fake it, right? This is the um, really, really old. Um, yeah, there's probably some public IT. Remember, the, if you remember these um, RCA cable modems, Doxis 1, the very first generation, 2002. This is IP cop running um, on here through a switch. Uh, this is was my network back in 2002, 17 years ago. So... <laughs> 
Yeah, I've been doing this for a while, so I don't have any land party pictures. I, I do have hacker party pictures, but those are different, and those are not going on display right here. Those not they're not on the cloud. Uh, nope, got nothing. All right, man, awesome. Uh, favorite distro, Pop OS or uh, RetroPie. RetroPie is a good distro. Love it. I like the old school games. All right, thanks.